What's up, my little willows? How's it going? This is me, Bruce Willow, and I'm about to show you my great guest, who we have the fortune of having here in Portugal. So, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Dr. Brad, thank you so much for being here. It's a huge honor, um, basically because of people like you. Whenever we talk about what we think we know in terms of repetitions, uh, what does muscles grow, uh, how do we get the most gains, it's because of people like you and your studies. So thank you so much for being here. How do you like Portugal so far? I love it. It's, uh, it's a beautiful country and the people are so warm and welcoming. Uh, couldn't, ha couldn't be having a better time. And I noticed that uh, I saw some of your Instagram stories. You went to Pastéis de Nata already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you you screwed up your gains, or <laughs> or do you think it's it's a huge boost in uh, insulin and, and it, maybe some? It was the insulin spike that I was going for there. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, not the taste. P post workout, no, it had nothing to do with taste. <laughs> well, well, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, uh, so I'm very glad that you like our our, our small little country, and uh, mm -hmm. we are opening our borders the more uh, the more and more. And people like yourselves, we always uh, enjoy having here. So it was a great workshop. So today we're going to talk a lot about the science behind the gains. But first of all, I really want to know the person behind the studies. So let's go to your bro past, can we? Sure. So you told us yesterday in our workshop, in our great workshop, that you were a bro for a long time. Mm -hmm. How long was this? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, when I first got into training, uh, I had little, when I first got into resistance training and lifting, I had very little uh, education, formal education. And my, uh, my education was through Muscle and Fitness Magazine, the Weeder Publications, uh, Muscle Media 2000 was a big magazine back then, Muscular Development, uh, Muscle Mag, there was all these muscle rags. And I would uh, wait till the new editions came out and, and basically perform the routines of, of the bros. And I would buy books, uh, I bought the, my Bible was the Arnold Schwarzenegger Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. And some of the other books, uh, Gold's Gym uh, Bible, Nutrition Bible, I think was one. Wow. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I and at the beginning I was able to make gains just like most people can. We, when you're not doing anything and uh, and you have some degree of genetic capabilities, you're going to make gains no matter what. Uh, but the gains quickly, or I shouldn't say quickly, but within a fairly short period of time. Uh, started to ebb and I plateaued and that's when I started saying, you know what, I need to be more scientific and I came from a very scientific family. Both my parents were physicians and they've always, um, ever since I was a kid, I was brought up to appreciate the scientific method and then I said, hey, I think I started realizing that this was a science and that if I wanted to maximize my own potential that I didn't have the genetics of the Arnold Schwarzeneggers or the Dorian Yates's. Uh, at the time, and uh, I didn't have their pharmacology, if Ooh. you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, of course. So uh, I, I had to uh, reinvent my game, and it made me become take a more scientific approach, and the more I started getting into the science, the more intrigued I became by it. So it's kind of the long story short on that. So uh, you were you were saying that uh, we, we you didn't have a lot of references other than the magazines. How old were you when you started to lift weights? 22. 22? Yeah. Okay, so it, what was your first reference? Like, did you watch a movie? Pumping no, iron, I, maybe? No, well, I did. I mean, subsequently I did. But I mean, basically I just was extremely, I think the story was similar with a lot of uh, aspiring bodybuilders that I was very disenchanted with my physique at the time. I was fresh out of college and um, uh, I was a skinny, I was skinny and I was kind of getting like skinny, I don't want to say fat, like meaning I was fat, but I just, I was flat, I just had no muscle. It was... Uh, it was very unsettling to me at the time, and uh, it affected my self-esteem. And I, my brother, uh, I attributed uh, and, and basically give uh, kudos to my brother for really being the impetus because he was started had started lifting, and I started seeing he was looking big after like a year. And uh, he uh, got got me a family membership to a Bally's Health Club back then, which was a big gym chain. And he helped me with my training in the initial stages, and I actually dedicated my first book to him. So, uh, cheers to my brother Glenn if he's out there. Or Older he's brother. There. Older no, he's, brother. He's actually two years younger. Two years younger. Uh, yeah. So anyway, but uh, I, the the uh, long story short, there is that uh, my route was very circuitous because I was not. Uh, I probably, when I was in high school, would have been voted the least likely to go into fitness as a career. And once I started getting into it, I just realized. It, 
it was kind of like the lightning bolt hit me and I was like, wow, this is, this is cool and this is for me. So up until then, what what, what were your interests, if you say? Well, I was that? a musician, actually. I oh, you were a musician? Yeah, musician. I, played, I played keyboards, and uh, I, I went to school for business uh, when I originally was in college, because I really didn't know what I wanted. I thought I wanted to be, or I, I did want to be a musician, but I didn't want to be living with my parents for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I, I kind of realized that was better as a, a an avocation, a secondary, you know, a hobby uh, career. And I still play to this day. But um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I figured business was a good, uh, a good uh, education, no matter what I wanted to do. And it really actually worked out well because I, not too long after I started getting into lifting, I opened up a personal training center. And uh, that, uh, the business acumen that I had learned in school certainly helped my uh, understanding of, of how to operate that business. So it's, it's great that yet the artist became the entrepreneur. And we see a lot of that happening nowadays. And people start off with, uh, from the get-go by doing instead of just studying how to do. I, I always ask this, this question, and I really don't know the answer yet. But let's say, well, let's knock on wood. Let's say I'm an opiate addict or something. And I go for therapy. Who do I want in front of me? The person with the experience or the person with the whole knowledge, like the, the knows the books by heart and stuff? Who, who would you like? <laughs> uh, well, I would say it shouldn't be an either. I want the person that has both. Both, right, right. So, but that person people is not always available. have. Well, <laughs> then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. uh, wait, I mean, you say you're in trouble. I mean, that to me is always the issue. Like we always have these people always pose binary choices, this or that. Yeah. When it really shouldn't have to be. I mean, I think one of the things that has set me apart as a researcher is my previous experience as a practitioner. So uh, I think that's one of the things that has resonated with a lot of. Uh, with so many people in terms of my research because the topics that I am investigating, have been investigating, are so practical to them. It was important to me. I, these are th I'm investigating. I'm a kid in a candy store now because I'm investigating everything that I wanted to know or, And w when I was a practitioner and realized there wasn't research on these things or wasn't sufficient research, and I'm doing them in ways that I think has, uh, has resonated with people. So. Yeah, uh, the artist in me has to know. I'm sorry to, for for going through this this aspect. Uh, people want to talk about gains, obviously, but I have to ask: uh, What bands do you like uh, for for a musician? What, what bands? What type of so music do you like? I, I have a fairly diverse musical uh, in interest and, and background, but I was I was brought up as a jazz musician. I was wow. really into jazz. Uh, so I mean, keyboardists like Bill, pianists like Bill Evans. Uh, Keith Jarrett, if you're not into jazz, you probably wouldn't know these, but these are like just icons uh, in the field. Uh, Pat Metheny, who's a guitarist, but his band, the Pat Metheny Band. But uh, when it comes to rock, I'm really into rock music. I, I like uh, a lot of the 70s bands, uh, some like the classic rock bands. Like, like the Eagles and stuff? Eagles, Crosby, Stills, Nash. Wow. Um, Steely Dan is one of my favorite bands still to this day. So yeah, and and then it's like Southern rock, like the Allman Brothers, I really like Leonard Skinner, um, just a very diverse Bill, and I really Billy Joel, Elton John are two two of my favorites. Oh yeah, I, I heard Omar Issa. You you were on on the video with having Omar Issa having that, and you uh, said that actually actually prefer way. you actually prefer Elton John well, to, to I, Billy Joel. I, I I mean again, that's that's like saying do I like you know uh, lobster or <laughs> or or sort of filet mignon. Um, but uh, if I would have to choose, which I don't, fortunately, I can like it's not binary. I can listen to both. <laughs> yeah, of course. But uh, yeah, Elton John, I think has the uh, the catalog. The when if you look at the spanning the catalog of his music, um, I would say Elton John. Yeah, a little bit more. I don't know. A little bit. A little bit more virtuoso. I guess. I guess it's a little bit more right. The, the, and when I listen to, to that music of his, the, the your song is like I want to cry right now. Mm. And and, and, and we don't want to go too much off on a music thing, but I, I would say with both of the artists, and I think in general this goes with rock mu musicians, but their earlier works uh, far surpass some of their later works. So Billy Joe yeah. actually yeah. stopped. Uh, writing, I think around 1990, in the early 90s. Yeah. So he kind of knew, he didn't felt he didn't have anything more to say. But Elton, uh, I do not really groove to any of his more recent stuff. I think anything after probably the 1980 or so. It's, well, you don't like in the middle of the night. You don't like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not my, really my thing. I, I like the older, 
<laughs> I remember being a kid and watching that 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 uh, video clip all the time, and I was like, "Come on, I'm sick of Billy Joel." But now I'm sick of other stuff, and I miss that. I miss that. But uh, well, I was I'm very uh, sadistic. Is that what, what what we say? Is that the word sadistic? Someone who thinks that everything that was in the past is better than nowadays. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what the word for that would be. Uh, in Portuguese, is saudosista. Yeah, so we're always okay. thinking that uh, yesterday was better than now and uh, whatever. Uh, I have a little well, bit of that. something to me. Some things are, some things aren't. Yeah, um, like nostalgia t- freak. <laughs> you're, you're, the TV sets today are much better than they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, and we can be here. The smartphones are a lot better now. I, anyone <laughs> yeah. that's arguing that, I think, is is making a kind of a false argument. But. Yeah, I, no, I I prefer the spectrums and stuff. <laughs> Remember the spectrum, right, right. the flip phones, <laughs> the flip phones. Yeah. Uh, so you were ta- you were talking about how uh, yesterday you said something very uh, intriguing, which was uh, whenever you do a study, you actually it's like a coin toss for you. So most of the time you weren't really exactly on the point. It wasn't really exactly on point the results with what you thought you were about to receive. Yeah. So you when you carry out a study, you make what's called a research hypothesis. So. Uh, and it's you try to base this on what the evidence, and sometimes there's no other research evidence. It could be a novel study. I mean, I carried out a study um, on high reps versus low reps, and, and that well, that one happened to have some good research. But the um, my hypothesis, research hypothesis, we did high repetition, so 30 reps to failure versus 10, 10 reps to failure, and these were. Uh, with resistance trained subjects. So there was really to that point, there was no studies in resistance trained subjects. So based on uh, my hypothesis, I, I felt that resistance, tra- there was some, there was evidence in non uh, untrained people that uh, you did not, there was no differences between higher reps and lower reps. And I made a point that untrained subjects, they get jacked from cardio. They'll do, yeah. they'll do spin cycling and their thighs will, Will get bigger. So uh, my thought was is that these resistance strain subjects would not see real gains; that it wouldn't be sufficient to challenge their muscles. And uh, I was proven wrong. And yeah, you know, like I mentioned, I would say that probably half of my research hypotheses turn out to be uh, unfounded. They turned out to be disproved, if you will, or found to be false. It's a bit within the study I do, and that doesn't mean that my studies are the be all end all. So each study, I also mentioned, each study is a piece in a puzzle. Yeah. So that's why you need multiple studies. I, I could be right or wrong. It, our study can either show the research hypothesis to be confirmed or, or, dis, or, or disproved, but that doesn't mean that other research might come along that would challenge whether that was correct. So th- this is why you know, people that are not researchers, and actually sometimes even some researchers, I think place way too much stock in uh, in individual studies where we need to look at a body of evidence to really get a, a true sense of what the literature shows and have an, also an appreciation for limitations of studies. Uh, every study will have limit. There's no such thing as a study without limitations. The more generalized the study is to avoid, to have more general, generalizability, the less in, what's called internal validity you're going to have, the more you're, you're not going to be able to... Uh, I'll give you a for instance rather than trying to be too esoteric sure. here. But uh, if let's say I'm going to do a study on uh, whether high reps or low reps is going to be uh, better. So if I'm just doing the study on resistance, young resistance trained males, I have very good validity to, to say in young resistance trained males, this is our findings. So you're, you're basically honing in, you get what's called internal validity. But I then cannot say that these results apply to elderly people, to women, to untrained subjects, to untrained males, to un- to train women, uh, to adolescents. Your generalizability in that respect becomes less. Whereas if I try to then include all of those, uh, let's say I have this, the same study, but I'm going to have some young women, some young men, untrained men, untrained women, trained men, trained women, elderly subjects, children, then I start losing the validity of the study because you don't know if the age groups confounded the results. You can try to do statistical analysis. But anyway, make a long story short, uh, each study begets another study. Each study is a piece in a puzzle. And uh, y- you need to be, uh, the, the true scientists 
looks at a body of literature and uh, tries not to tries to understand when there's not enough literature to draw strong conclusions, knows when there's enough to start drawing stronger and stronger inferences. And uh, also, I, I mentioned one of the tr to me, one of the big um, benefits or, or well, right, one of the big benefits of doing a meta analysis, which is kind of a study of studies, is that you can start to draw, inferences from the body of literature if the meta-analysis is, uh, is well-conducted and it has a sufficient number of studies. So we have to wait. A lot of the meta-analysis that uh, come out are based on small amounts of studies. So if I do a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies on, and there's only four studies in the literature, uh, it doesn't mean it's not, it's better than just looking at one, but there's, you have a lot of limitations. But if there's 20 studies, you can get a much better sense. Uh, you're getting a much better pooling of the literature, uh, and also you're getting more uh, statistical power to draw more quantitative inferences, meaning that you can um, start to say, all right, how much of a difference is there? When you have a lot of studies, the statistical power is, gets better and better, so you can say what's called an effect size, how much different is the the magnitude of difference. Yeah, the equity becomes becomes greater. Uh, and a lot of people nowadays are really clinging to the study as an end-all, be-all, and we can't have that because ba they basically give you the principles and then you, as a personal trainer or as, a, as someone who is well, about to train yourself, you should infer the method that works for you. But sometimes it's better to start from the generalization or someone that the researchers like yourselves have done in order to pave the way and, and say, okay, so I'm sure that this way is probably the best way. And if I have to do some, some adjustments in the long run, I will. So, well, and that's absolutely true. So when, especially now there's different types of research and we, we don't have the time where I'm sure the most uh, people in the audience wouldn't <laughs> really care enough for me to go through all the nuances. But I, I, what I think is really important to understand is that uh, even when, let's say you have a lot of studies and you could draw inferences, good inferences from the research, the research will only provide guidelines. We should only look to research. Research is never going to tell you as an individual what to do. It's going to provide you a guideline. But what everyone has to remember is that research will report the means. And when we're talking about applied aspects, uh, there's going to be a lot of variation around that mean. So what that means is that, and the mean is the average, if, uh, for those yeah. who don't know. So if I'm report, let's say I'm doing a weight loss study and you report 10%, uh, a loss of 10 pounds, that would be an average loss amongst all of the subjects. Some subjects might have lost 20 pounds, other subjects might have lost nothing. If you were that person that lost nothing, obviously that didn't, work for that particular person. Now, could there be other reasons why that didn't work? And that's what you'd have to then maybe, if you'd have to then look into the study more. And, and that's where the true, uh, I want to say look into the study, look into the other factors that would be involved in, in what if it was, a, let's say, a low-carb, high-carb study. Maybe that person had other issues. Uh, so bottom line there is that it's extremely important to use research to get you in the ballpark, to, to give you an understanding of where to start, and then it's going to be kind of an N equals one. That's where you start to have to experiment and see how you do and, and then be, uh, be judicious and be introspective in terms of assessing progress and understanding whether you should change, when and, and how you might want to change things. Yes, um, I um, let's let's talk gains. Uh, let's let's uh, uh, begin with the, with the muscle building aspect and your, the findings. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as a, I, I work as a professional stuntman, I've been a stuntman for eleven years now, and uh, to me, uh, it was all very functional from the get-go, and I started doing CrossFit as well, and a lot of functional movements. However, I feel that hypertrophy is from that community of people who do functional training. I'm not sure I like this this ex, this this sentence, functional training, but we always I can don't make really it. Either, so. Yeah, yeah, of course. But but sometimes it helps to 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 have a notion of, of what we're talking about. So a lot of compound movements that use a lot of muscles, and the uh, people who think of the of the weight training as a means to get uh, from here to there or move uh, large loads in the uh, in the longest. Um, 
in the longest distance in the least amount of time for instance that's that's the uh, one of the uh, cues of crossfit as as to functional uh, training for instance uh but i think uh, uh Hypertrophy should not really be one thing only for the bodybuilders. I think, I believe that hypertrophy is one of the main shells in your body, even to protect you. And as a stuntman, I can say that if I, for if I, for example, don't train muscles like my neck, my back, if I don't have a robust anatomy or a robust muscle uh, gain, I'm not going to be very well prepared to get hit by a car. For example, in in the most literal sense, in my case. So, would you say that hypertrophy is lacking in a lot of athletes from nowadays? People, especially people who are going to that functional side of the. Um, but when it comes to athletics, so the, the, these are questions that are difficult to answer because uh, the extent of hypertrophy that you need would be specific to what your goals are. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a distance runner would want to have very little hypertrophy. It just carrying more muscle for them would actually weigh them down and going long distances. So if your goal is uh, aerobic endurance, uh, especially uh, long term, you know, over long periods of uh, aerobic endurance, you'd want to have very little. Uh, if you're a uh, soccer player, you'd want to have some, but I mean, it then also depends on where the muscle is. I mean, how much do you need in your upper body? You'd probably want to have more in your lower body. So these are all things that when you're talking athletics and, and training athletes, which I've done a lot of, uh, you'd always want to look at the specificity of, of what they're trying to accomplish. For the general public, I think it's, it's much more, or I can make much more better generalizations because your functional, most people's functional requirements, that's why functional fitness, if functional fitness is talking athletics, athletes, then we're in a different ballgame. But uh, no pun intended. But with um, the general public, most people's, what are their functional requirements? They're, uh, are they uh, pushing cars? You know, most people, they're picking up packages, they're doing everyday things, and you're going to be able to achieve those functional tasks by doing virtually any decent decently structured program and you could be doing single joint movements for the most part and, and get most of your functional benefits from that that you would need in, in the everyday life dailies of activity living. Uh, so how much hypertrophy do you need? That is a question is how much do you want? Some people like, uh, I, I mean, personally, I like more hypertrophy on myself, um, but I, I can't tell people what they need and, and if they're lacking, that to me is an individual uh, concern. And and to me, I think one of the other issues is as talking as a former personal trainer, someone that still uh, coaches other personal trainers, one thing that I always say is that the most important thing is finding out what the goals are. Always do ne never project your own goals on an individual. Ask them what their goals are. And if they say, hey, I want to be jacked at the beach, then you're going to make them you're, you're going to structure a program that's going to help them get maximum gains if they say hey i want to look like bruce lee they don't need bruce lee was not huge yeah he had, he had good quite small I right exactly i think it was 130 pounds yeah. so uh just different it would be a different training style yeah of course and uh so uh let's start with volume uh a lot of uh, contradiction in the, in the in the field of, of of volume. What would you say is the ideal volume? Uh, let's let's go with sets and repetitions, for instance, uh, for a muscle to grow. What are the findings? There's no ideal volume. Uh, ideal volume will be specific to the individual. Like when, when you're asking me questions like that, the applied aspects, it would always be an it depends answer. So we can, as I talked before, we can give generalizations. Um, their volume is a driver of hypertrophy, a primary driver of hypertrophy. Uh, not necessarily the prime. Some people confuse it by saying that it's the primary driver. It is a primary driver. Uh, I would say the primary driver is uh, the effort that you put in training with a high degree of effort because you can do volume till the cows come home. If you're not putting in a lot of effort in those sets, it's not going to do much. So, um, and vice versa, if you put in a lot of effort, even with low amounts of volume, you can make considerable gains. So uh, the effort to me is the most important, the primary driver, but volume is a primary driver, and how much volume? There's no answer to that. Um, my, on a general basis, uh, I would say starting someone off probably around 
looking at 10 sets per muscle group per week probably is a good uh, generalization where people can start. But uh, I, I'm a believer, this has not been tested uh, in the literature. Uh, at some point, I would hope to do that, but uh, it would be a very grueling study to carry out. But I'm uh, certainly in, in practice, anecdotally, I've used uh, the, the principle of progressively increasing uh, volume over time. So having a starting with a somewhat low volume, progressing to a moderate volume, and then uh, culminating in a high volume phase, which is intended to cause overreaching, uh, functional overreaching, meaning that you're pushing the body to its limits and then going back to a lower volume approach. And that's all dependent on the person. There's no specific volumes that you would always use for everyone. Anyone that tells you this is the volume yeah, or that wants to get course. that from the literature is, is bark, as I talked before, it's silliness. They're barking up the wrong tree because the literature will never tell you what the best volume is for an individual. It's just gonna set guidelines for people. And, and uh, most of the findings were, and, and I, I, these, these are obviously generalizations, but most of the findings were about two and sometimes three weeks per, uh, three times, uh, sorry, that's, that's the frequency. Uh, I, uh, talking about the frequency now. Uh, so uh, the generalization was that uh, two to three times per week per muscle was a good idea uh, for people to get the most gains. So structuring the volume then becomes uh, a concern. So there's going to always be a, a uh, interaction between variables, um, whether it's reps, volume, frequency, uh, rest intervals, all will have effects on each other in some way. Um, and those things have to be taken into account. So when we talk about volume as a in a vacuum as a stand or any of the variables in a vacuum, it really kind of does a disservice because, yeah, you have to look at the interaction. Uh, the the literature, we actually have a meta-analysis that hopefully will be, be published shortly. That's currently in review now. And, uh, yeah, it, it shows very that volume is not a huge, by itself not a huge factor, but there's uh, caveats to it. And it seems that two is better than one, at least mildly, but I, then it's going to somewhat depend on volume because if you're doing, the higher your volumes are, the more it's going to start to benefit to spread out that volume over the course of a week and not do it all in one session. Uh, it seems that if you're going to, the higher volumes uh, when they're performed in one session result in um, what some people have termed wasted, wasted sets, sets. Yeah. that uh, that you don't derive the the benefits of the uh, the spikes in muscle protein synthesis from it. So then spreading out that volume over, let's say if you're going to do uh, 15 sets per muscle per week. Uh, 16, make it 16 and make it a rounder number. You would do eight sets and eight, eight, let's say eight sets Monday, eight sets Thursday. I'm just not that there's any magic to that. It could be Friday or, yeah, sure. but, uh, <laughs> but rather than doing 16 sets in a given workout. Okay. And, uh, I, I saw yesterday that you showed us as well that, uh, through the generalization of the studies and the meta analysis that, uh, uh, the key, uh, the, peak point in which there was more muscle development, uh, and obviously it depends on the muscle that you're working as well, but uh, it was about 18 sets per week? Uh, that's So that seems to be where these things are always somewhat in, in a state of fluctuation, but the body of literature at this point, my colleague James Krieger is another really good, good guy to follow if you're into uh, evidence-based fitness. Uh, he's continuing, we've published meta analysis on this and he's continuing to update the meta analysis as new uh, studies come in. And that seems to be somewhere, probably a good, now a, a good, uh, general guideline as to where the upper end starts to come in. So you'd want to maybe go looking at 10 as, as a general guideline again. So it's not that these are hard sure. guidelines, but somewhere between 10 to 20 sets seem to be kind of that sweet spot. Sweet spot. But could some people benefit from from less or more? Yeah. And you also have to consider that these are more generalizations overall. Could a given muscle group benefit from more or less? From like a specialization standpoint, you might want to specialize. Like if a, you have a lagging muscle group, could maybe more than that 
Yeah, those are all things that still are understudied, but certainly that there's suggestions that might be the case. Could it be true? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just asking. Could it be true that, for instance, a, 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 a single joint movement or, or a, a small muscle, let's say, like bicep or tricep, uh, in the case of the bicep mostly, uh, would uh, would handle more volume that, than a, a, a big muscle? Or am I... Uh, those are questions that really have not, we don't have good clarity on it from the evidence. So it would be hard for me to give you a, uh, a good answer as far as that goes. And I, I would also say with the, what I, the uh, answer I can give with some good confidence is that that would vary between individuals too, as to uh, how much volume for a given muscle would be ideal that it would, some people might have need more volume in, let's say the biceps. And I don't think, I wouldn't think the muscle itself is, is really the, answer there. Now, one thing that seems to, or potentially can be uh, more relevant is upper versus lower body because you're using your lower body. So your lower body, for the vast, major, uh, vast majority of people, is used to walk, to run, to do all sorts of things. So there's more activation of the muscles. And that might, uh, there, there's some evidence, still somewhat weak, but I would say the evidence is is at least something to consider that the lower body might need somewhat higher volumes because it's a muscle that gets already is stimulated and that to uh, really uh, tap into it, you might need higher resistance training volumes. So there's, there's a little bit more overlap into everyday uh, life with, with the lower body maybe. Yeah, exactly. Like and that, like, so walking so upstairs. From, and, a, yeah. from a muscular endurance standpoint. Yeah. So to tap into that, tap into the, uh, potential might require greater, you know, to overload it might require more volume. Yeah. Uh, somewhat higher One thing volumes. that went a little bit against my, my perception or what I originally thought is that you told us that, uh, I'm not sure if it was one study, if it was a meta-analysis, but uh, the, the for women was a little different and they uh, could handle in terms of hypertrophy a little less volume in terms of the peaking of the muscles. No, Did well, I that, get it wrong? Well, it was just that there's been a study that, I, it's not necessarily that women can handle less, but or there was a study that was carried out in women that showed that... Uh, over a 24-week period, study period, uh, their gains topped out around 10, 10 sets per muscle per week. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that could, have, if they did the study on men, could that, in that particular environment, you can't localize it. Like, you'd have to do a more, to try to say whether that's a gender-specific finding would require a lot more study. So you can't necessarily base those findings and then attribute that to the gender response. There could be other, it could be something inherent within the design. It could be the longer time frame. So I, I can't say. Yeah, because they do on Instagram, they do like 30 sets per side of the of the booty <laughs> of the glutes. So, so, so I, I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I will tell you this. Uh, so I'm a, uh, the thesis, I'm on the thesis committee for a young investigator and um she just finished data collection on a study that looked at high volumes for the glutes, specific to the glutes in women, and we'll see what they showed. We haven't analyzed the data yet, but it'll be interesting to see whether uh, the higher volume had greater effects. Because your buddy, I, if, if I can say so, your Dr. Brett Contreras, mm -hmm. uh, is I think he's an advocate of training for like he's, he's uh, <laughs> it's it's a little awkward to say that his area of expertise is the, is the glutes, but it, it kind of is, right? Mm -hmm. no, so he, is. he he's into a lot of volume for the glutes and a lot of variety, right? Mm -hmm. So could could it be that the glutes, because they have some sort of overlap to all uh, daily activities as well, they handle more volume? Could it be true when you're asking me those questions i can only say maybe that those are hypotheses that yeah. you can draw but if you're asking is there research to show one way or the other no one thing i will say so yeah my good friend brett Contreras, one of my my best buds is a uh i mean he is the glute guy he is the world's leading expert in that and i can only tell you from an anecdotal standpoint he's used very high volumes with his uh figure competitors bikini competitors and they've and a lot of them have shown very good results, but that doesn't know he's specifically said some of them don't. So it's that again seems to be something that is specific to the individual. One thing he'll uh, he tells me all the time is that you know I do these same the same thing that really works well for one person isn't working as well for yeah. others, and they changes it. And that's what research again is never going to tell you. So the person who just uh, the, the it's very misguided and, and uninformed just to say hey look this 
figure competitor achieve these incredible glutes by doing this routine so that they must need higher volumes or they must need these types of exercises, et cetera. That's, you have to look at your own genetics and, and other lifestyle factors, and that's going to uh, interact and, and to ultimately determine what is best. For sure, I think. I think social media, in a way, has a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff in terms of uh, follow my program now, do this, do, look like me. And it's like, well, oh, come on. It's like the principle of uh, principles over methods every time. Uh, I, I've heard it once. I've heard it a thousand times. And people do say it in a, in a sense. I think, I think most of the... I think the most of the truth, if we can call it truth, because a scientist never believes in truth, I guess, but uh, it comes from the basic stuff, and it's always the basics. People trying to go over it or trying to differentiate their product by saying, oh, yeah, but you got to do it with this little tweak or this little tweak or now do or, or programs that have a name or, or diets that have a name like ketogenic, like paleo, et cetera. It's all, it's all more gimmicks than, than probably the basics would actually turn out in terms of results, right? Yeah. Do, how, do you, how do you feel about social media in general? The, the, It's a double-edged sword, so um, it's been incredible to, and it is incredible, to disseminate information, but there's also a high signal-to-noise ratio where there's a lot of bad information out there that people can't sift through, and there's also a lot of trolls that uh, unfortunately screw things up for, for others. Uh, so, I, I, look, social media has been one of my main tools in disseminating Evidence, what I feel is, is good evidence-based information, but um, some people don't use it in ways that they use it more for um, nefarious, um, you know, practices. Yeah, I, I found it very uh, uh, hilarious that w one of these days I was listening to a podcast with with a coach called John Wellborn. He he played in the NFL for like 10 years. <laughs> he said the internet is a great place. It's the only place where a 12 year old vegan called me a pussy, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So calling a guy who played 10 years in the NFL a pussy. That's funny. That's, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, what about uh, loads? Um, if I want to grow my muscles, uh, generally speaking, obviously, we're, we're always uh, going that way. Uh, unfortunately, we can't have the power. It's this, the methods. But uh, if I, if I want to grow my muscles to the biggest extent, uh, what would be my ideal loads or percentage work if if what what has the research uh, drawn in terms of conclusions so i'll go back to my comment that when you're asking me an applied question i'm going to give you a kind of a general answer that yeah, it depends and and what i will say with that is you can uh, the research now so this is an area where i can give a very definitive opinion uh that and there's compelling evidence to this, that uh, the research really compellingly shows you can gain muscle over a very wide spectrum of loading ranges. Uh, we have some recent research that shows under about 30% one RM seems not to be as effective, although there's even another study that con uh, contradicted our study. But let's even say, let's go with that, 30% one RM is like 50 plus reps. Uh, on certain, depends on the exercise, but can be anywhere from 50 RM, so a very, wow. very high load, uh, uh, a very uh, light load. And uh, anything, let's say, between, I, I would give you a kind of a, let's even say a more reasonable repetition range, because who's going to want to do, I don't think there's any reason you need to do 50, but let's even say anything from three to five up to uh, 30, rep 30 repetition max, provided you are training with a high level of effort, meaning that you're coming at least close to muscle failure. And assuming you're doing that, you can gain muscle at all of those rep ranges. Now, to me, I think, uh, and this is one of the more intriguing areas uh, of which that I'm currently pursuing a, uh, a study that should be carried out hopefully shortly, But uh, whether there is a fiber type specific response, meaning that does, uh, let's say, light loads have greater effects on type 1 muscle fibers, which are your endurance-based fibers, and does your heavy loads have greater uh, effects on your type 2 fibers, which would be your strength type fibers. Yeah, fast twitch, yeah. Your fast twitch, right. And um, we don't really, there is some evidence that that's the case at this point, but it's still far from being, in my opinion, far from being definitive in any way. 
And uh, if true, then that would have good implications for uh, training, interesting implications, both for athletics and for bodybuilding. And, and I would say at this point, based on that, if your goal is maximizing hypertrophy, I think there is benefit to training across a spectrum of repetition ranges, meaning that you do some work in, let's say, the three to five rep range, or at least five, somewhere in the five. Uh, 10 rep range, eight to 12, and then going up around 20 to 25 maybe. So you would kind of at least touch all bases on the potential for maximizing fiber type development if that is in fact the case. Yes, so basically the science is telling us that the body does not know how to count. It only equates effort. And when we say effort, do we say, in terms of, um, and I'm probably really going to speak in layman's terms here, but uh, but I don't care. It's just the the the. Uh, what do you really encapsulate as effort? Uh, would it be the idea of not being able to do one more, so going to failure or feeling the burning sensation, or both? Pro proximity to failure. Proximity to failure. Yeah. So a colleague of mine named Eric Helms, another really astute uh, fitness pro that everyone there, everyone out there should follow. Yeah. Uh, he did his doctoral research in a concept called repetitions in reserve, RIR, which is basically how many reps are you short of failure? And he actually validated this concept where uh, people, when they're taught how to uh, estimate, they're able to say, all right, I could have done one more rep. I could have done two more reps. And that's where you want to, to me, using this RIR technique, how many reps are you short of failure? And a rep, an RIR of one to two, depending on the rep range you're training in. So now if you're training at a five RM, uh, let's say two reps short of failure is gonna be a lot different than if you're at a uh, 15 RM being two reps short of failure. But anyway, somewhere in that, assuming your loads are let's say six to 20, uh, one to two reps short of failure at maximum would be a high, what I would consider a high level of effort. And, and if I'm doing, for instance, four sets of each exercise, should I do that type of, of intensity or, or effort in all of them? Um, well, no. I, I, should you? It, th th these are, again, it, it depends question. It really depends on how the whole uh, routine is structured. And the question also is, do you need to train to failure at all? Uh, I generally think there is potential benefit to doing it. There is still, the research is very hazy on whether it is, requisite, whether it's required. But um, without that hard evidence, to me, you have to base it on what you, on logic, on, on personal expertise. And I do feel that, you know, maybe going on the last set to failure most of the time seems to have benefits. Uh, but do the other sets, could there be a set or two that's a little less, so maybe, maybe three RIR? Yeah, but I, the majority of sets should be, that's the generalization I can make is that your majority of your sets, depending upon many things as the structure of your routine, should be within an RIR of one to two okay. or, or zero to two. Okay. And uh, uh, what about the, the, the DOMS, the late onset muscle, muscle soreness? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have the idea in mind that they have to really go home and feel like exhausted or not even walk for the next couple of days. Is that really necessary to get the most gains? No, not only is it necessary to, to really trash yourself as counterproductive because then you're going to compromise your ability to train uh, in your next session, and that's never a good... If you're, if you're not going to be able to train with your full intensity, that's never a good thing. Now, the question that arises, is some degree of muscle soreness beneficial or not soreness? Well, soreness is somewhat equated to... Even that's not a really great... Uh, marker for muscle damage. It's yeah, it's very it, individual as well. Some people never don't feel never sore. get sore yeah, and, yeah. and still experience some damage. So, when it comes to damage, is a let's say a moderate level of damage beneficial? Where it's not debilitating, it's kind of mildly sore, if you will, if, if you're going to use soreness. But there's let's say some mild to moderate, somewhat moderate muscle damage. Is that a uh, does that help enhance the hypertrophic response? And that's a question that remains to be answered. Uh, I know there's people on both sides that have more definitive opinions. I think that both, any time, anyone who's trying to make a definitive opinion is not basing it on hard evidence. They're basing it more on just their own opinion, what they feel uh, on um, you know, personal bias, I would say, because uh, the we don't have any, you can't draw causality based on the, data that we have. It's all based on, on really theoretical constructs on, on some basic, uh, uh, basic research 
into things like uh, what are the effects of muscle damage on satellite cells, what are their effects on, which are satellite cells help to uh, repair muscles and also donate their nuclei for more protein production, and on other things like myokines, which are uh, substances that muscles produce that are can be used as growth factors. So whether they actually enhance the effect of the contractions by themselves, those are those are questions that we don't know and that probably is going to be a good while before we get some clear evidence on that, just because it's an extremely difficult, if not, I think at this point, almost impossible uh, topic to really study in a controlled fashion. Why do you think there were so many little, so, so, so little studies up to, I think it was 2015, for example, on the, on the, I think it was on the case of frequency of, of, of working out that you told us yesterday? Well, it's frequency with hypertrophy. So there's been there's been a bunch of studies that have looked at frequency with strength. So strength had been much more well studied. So one of the real issues, and this is one of the things that I'm happy that I, I think I've had a part in, in changing based on the popularity of the research that I've carried out and that we're now getting a lot more hypertrophy specific studies that really focus on hypertrophy. But I, I think the real issue was is that uh, previously, up until somewhat recently, uh, strength coaches cared about athletic performance. And hypertrophy, as we just talked about before, by itself is not a, a goal of an athlete, unless you're a bodybuilder. Uh, or in some cases, like a football lineman might want to have, you kind of talk maybe a stuntman, where the having some extra bulk would help to absorb, uh, not make you move as much, you'd be more... Uh, harder to move, but but for the vast majority of athletes, the only reason you really want hypertrophy is to get stronger. And generally, you'd want to have as little hypertrophy as possible for maximal strength gains because the higher hypertrophy might compromise endurance, aerobic endurance over time because you're carrying around a greater amount of, of weight. So uh, the studies would that had been done focused on strength, focused on power, and when they did study hypertrophy, it was kind of more toward more specific to uh, are these affecting strength. So they just didn't care as much about hypertrophy. And I think it was a little short-sighted because outside of the small, fairly small sports circles, your general population who makes up the majority of personal training visits and the majority of people in the gym, of course, uh, they couldn't give to about how high, you know, adding an extra inch to their vertical jump, you yeah, know, as the yeah. average personal training client. Yeah, I, nobody asked that. I if, never had, yeah. a, you know, 18 years of personal trainer, I never had a client come in and say, that wasn't an athlete, and say, you know what, my goal is to increase my vertical jump by an inch. Uh, so anyway, so what did they want? They wanted, they want more gains. So uh, that really is uh, something that I think is being recognized more and is being studied more. Oh, fantastic. And uh, what about the tempo uh, in terms of eccentric versus concentric? Uh, what does the science suggest? So the evidence is somewhat limited. Uh, concentric, there's very little compelling evidence that, let's say, between one to three seconds makes much difference. Anything under about three second con concentric, there's really not much research in tempos higher than three second concentric. There's uh, only one study in super slow as yeah, well. Yeah, there was a study done in super slow training which showed a distinct disadvantage, hypertrophic disadvantage. And there's a lot of uh, research on super slow with strength and virtually all of them show negative effects of super slow on strength. But only one study that I would say has good, that was done in a manner that you could draw good uh, conclusions from hypertrophy and that showed that the traditional training, a one up, one down, uh, had much greater uh, effects on muscle cross-sectional area than a 10-second up, 4-second down. Now, that's one study. Like I said, you can't yeah. put too much stock in that, but the one study we have doesn't show a benefit, and I just don't see much logical basis for it. From an eccentric standpoint, some interesting data. Um, a colleague of mine carried out a study showing that uh, a 4-second eccentric had greater hypertrophy than a 2-second eccentric. When, so it was one second up, two seconds down versus one second up, four seconds down. And uh, the four seconds down had showed greater hypertrophy than the one, I'm sorry, one second up, one second down versus one second up, four seconds down. And the one second eccentric had less hypertrophy than the four second. We carried up a follow-up study. We, we I collaborated with them on the follow-up study. We looked at two seconds down versus four seconds down and really no differences. 
And another recent study was just published showing similar results that with two seconds uh, two seconds down uh -huh. eccentric versus four second eccentric, no hypertrophic differences. What about isometric? I always wondered because uh, coming from this this functional use that word again, but coming from this functional background with doing a lot of. Uh, Let's say, for example, uh, Zercher carries, Farmer carries, stuff like that. How come no bodybuilder does these type of, of, of exercises? I can't, I mean, it's just not tradition. So the bodybuilders usually go with tradition, but what, part of the other problem is it's just not a well-studied topic. So in a controlled fashion, whether isometrics, how they compare to traditional resistance training. And one of the real issues is how do you control? So let's say you're going to do an isometric hold. Or let's say for biceps. So I'm just holding the weight at 90 degree angle. How are you equating that to on a volume basis to, let's say, doing regular training? How, do, how long are you going to hold that weight? How much weight are you going to hold? Uh, how, you know, what, what, when is your degree of effort? Is your degree of effort when you just can't hold it? Is, so these are all questions that make it very difficult to compare apples to apples and there's really not much good uh, research or any good research that I would consider that where I can make definitive anything uh, close to a definitive conclusion or even give even more general conclusions on that. What I, what I would say is that we do know that isometrics can uh, build muscle. We are, I will give you a scoop that I'm currently in the process of carrying out a study, but well, it's not quite like that. So what we are doing is we're having both groups go through a traditional resistance training program. Uh, so they're doing six exercises, whole body exercises, so squats, leg press, uh, chest press, shoulder press, lat pull down row. And after one group is just doing that routine, the other group for 30 seconds, they're, they're going to rest each, both groups rest two minutes, but the one of the groups for 30 seconds of the two minute rest does a isometric hold, not with a weight though, just a like a posing where they're just squeezing their muscles in an isometric hold after the exercise is over for 30 seconds. And uh, we're midway through the study now, so I can't even give you any inkling as to how, no clue how that might turn out. Oh, I thought I was going to see the end of the movie right now. <laughs> no, it's, we're, we're really right in the middle and the uh, denouement is still a while away. Oh, that... That, that's that's a lead up that's a lead up for you guys to uh, be very uh, uh, to follow obviously Dr. Brad Schoenfeld and uh, to watch what is going on because sometimes I, I like the memes that you post uh, uh, you said something about cardio you said something about cardio I don't think if it was high intensity cardio versus moderate cardio there was this Instagram post you you posted one of these days about cardio do you recall well, it might have been the uh, that plyometrics aren't cardio. Oh, yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. That people are using plyometric exercise, which really is a, plyometrics, for those who don't know, are types of exercises that initiate what's called a stretch shortening cycle, where you get a rapid eccentric contraction, and then you have to extremely quickly transition into a concentric contraction. So a box jump, depth jumps, these are uh, so-called plyometric movements because you're initiating stretch shortening cycles. And there are a lot of physique coaches that I keep seeing that are using these as like cardio for their figure competitors and, 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 other, and other physique athletes. And it's just not not the right type of exercise. It's, it's misusing the exercise. Now, will you get some cardiovascular benefits from that? Yeah, but there you can't do a lot of them. So the volume that you're gonna do, and they're use, if, even if you wanna use it as a high intensity type of move, they're very, they have to be very controlled movements. Uh, or you risk injuring yourself, and when you st when you start to try to do them quickly, you don't get a stretch shortening cycle. You're just basically just doing hot. You're not even hot. You're you're not able to initiate a good stretch shortening cycle. So you're basically you're kind of bastardizing the exercise, yeah. and by doing that consistently enough to get any cardiovascular effect or, or fat. It's really not even for cardio. They do it for fat burning. For a fat burning effect, you'd, the volume you'd have to do would just really increase the chance of injury. So it's just a, a poor strategy in my humble opinion. And, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to detriment a little bit of the, of the gains, right? Of, of the actual work on the body, of the sculpting of the body. Mm, I mean, that would, whether that has, cardio can have negative effects on gains too. So if you, that, that would depend. But I, again, to me, it's more a question of, it's a misuse of the exercise. 
that's not the proper way to do it and uh, to to do it uh, to try to get a fat burning effect you're going to be risking injury you're going to be over use the joints are going to be subjected to uh, to high impacts that you shouldn't be uh, it's the um, repetitive motion injuries repetitive joint stresses that are very high impact it's just not not good for the joints not good for for your yeah, your body then has to recover not only from the hypertrophy sessions, but also from the cardio yeah, sessions. Yeah, it could, it could impede your recovery. That is true to a great so cardio can impede your recovery, but it could do so to a greater extent as well than, than cardio would. Uh, doctor, just to brush a little bit on nutrition uh, before we finish, uh, uh, let's let's start with, with with a good segue. Cardio fasted. What do you think of this? What, what is what is your opinion? So we carried out a study on that and showed that it had little benefit, uh, I mean, no benefit in, in our study. And the uh, it's a compelling body of evidence from a fat burning standpoint doesn't show it has much, if any, effect. Now, can I completely rule out? We, we're still the only ones that did a controlled study that looked at the body fat uh, standpoint in a caloric deficit. There have been other studies that have been carried out that looked at it when people just are allowed to eat what they want, but that's not how generally you're going to use that. Yeah. But from a, uh, w what I would say is, can I completely rule out there would be no benefit? No. I would say with a high degree of confidence that any benefit would be very small. If there is one, I, I'm still skeptical that there's any benefit, but any benefit would be small. And uh, for 99% of the population, it would make zero difference. And it could potentially impair your adherence. If you now, if you like to train fasted, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with it. I had originally uh, looked at some of the research and thought that maybe the, because uh, there is some research showing that you get increased protein breakdown uh, from fasted cardio, but I don't, I think in retrospect, I think I overthought that uh, and I just don't think you're, it's going to have, my, I don't really think it's going to negatively impact your physique. Uh, but I, I certainly don't think that uh, most people who are doing it need to do it. And it, if they don't like training fasted, so some people are slogging out of bed and saying, oh my God, I got to get my fasted cardio and so I get shredded. You're not going to get shredded from it. It's not, if anything, your any results that maybe happen would be so small. And most people are at body fat levels where they'd never see, that would only be apparent if you're a pro bodybuilder or a high level uh, phys figure competitor, physique competitor who's at very, very low body fat levels already. And then maybe uh, could that have some very small benefits. Uh, so for them, would I say don't do it? I'd say if you want to. I, I certainly will tell you that there's the majority of, of physique uh, athletes don't do faster cardio and they get shredded without doing faster cardio. So certainly not a requisite. And uh, th those that's one of those things that's been sold very well, that's been... Uh, They've gotten a lot of hype, but I just don't think that it, the hype uh, supports the, the claims. It, it makes for very good Instagram stories when people go, for my my fasted cardio, did, did you see the, the, the feet just walking on a turf, walking the dog and stuff? So it's, it makes for very good oh, yeah. content, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, would you um, still, uh, would you separate the cardio session from the, from the uh, bodybuilding session uh, anyways, or? Uh? Generally speaking, if you can, that's a good choice. Um, so there's something called a concurrent training uh, effect. Well, it's, basically, it's the uh, chronic interference hypothesis, where concurrent training is training both aerobic and uh, and resistance training. Not when it doesn't necessarily have to be at the same time, but they use both of those in your program. Uh, so, will that does cardio have a negative effect on on muscle gain? The answer is it depends. So. It would depend on how much cardio you're doing, how much resistance training you're doing, what type of cardio are you doing, how long are you doing it, how many days are you doing it, are you doing it in the same session? So these are all things that uh, that could impact them. So if you're asking me, should you do it in the same session? I mean, ideally, it's probably better to, to separate it. Uh, if you're doing low volume, low intensity training, it's not going to have any effect. So you could do it really whenever you want. If you can do any type of, I think the more, So, yeah, it's, it's certainly generally better to separate it from an intracellular signaling uh, standpoint, which is what drives both uh, an anabolism, which is building up of tissue, and catabolism, like breakdown of fat. But I would generally say the best strategy for the general public here uh, would be to 
structure your cardio so that it's done. If you're going to do it in the same session, do it after your resistance training session. Thank you so much. And uh, what uh, about the as in terms of nutrition? What do you what do you what do you see people? Uh, what do you think? What do you think are the most uh, the biggest errors or the biggest misjudgments people make about nutrition that make you go like oh. Uh, so many. There's a lot of bro uh, science, I, I bro mean, science in the in the nutrition uh, as well. Just to go through, one is that you need to be keto to to get shredded. You know, you <laughs> cutting out carbs is the key to get shredded. That is not the case. Doesn't mean that you can't get shredded cutting out carbs. But you actually need a, a carbs uh, for prote protein synthesis. Uh, am I right? No, you don't need no? It for protein synthesis, but it, it can help to uh, enhance your training. Uh, certainly the bodybuilding style workout is largely driven by uh, the by glycolysis which is the breakdown of carbohydrate but uh, it's just I, I mean again I don't I think to maximize muscle there's a benefit to taking in carbohydrates at least uh, doesn't have to be a high carbohydrate diet but certainly a moderate uh, carb diet and I think the, the more like I said the bigger myth there is that you need to to be to de deplete carbs to have very low carbohydrate intake to get shredded that's a complete myth uh, that intermittent fasting is the key to getting shredded again it's a viable strategy if you like doing it but certainly no magic to it it's just it helps you to maintain your energy balance um, that you need huge pro amounts you need to consume huge amounts of, of protein to get big uh, beyond roughly two grams per kilogram per day, which is- Oh, you're way. talking in kilos already. Yeah. Oh, nice. We're <laughs> Portugalizing you. <laughs> and for, for our American friends, a little less than a pound, <laughs> a, a gram per pound, uh, there's no, be basically you just oxidize the uh, the amino acids from the proteins. So no benefit to that. And I could just go on and on. There's so many nutritional myths that are uh, perpetrated. And uh, I'd say probably just as many or more than resistance training. And somebody asked you yesterday, so I think it's a good point for people to make. Uh, uh, you basically said that uh, instead of taking either leucine or the BCAs, it's always better to have the complete uh, source of whey protein like the, 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 the shake, right? Yeah, so when you talk about taking a single amino acid or a few amino acids like BCAs, your whole proteins are going to include, there's nine essential amino acids. So your body needs, the, the term essential amino acids, is the term yeah. essential is there for, for a logical. reason because you need yeah. those amino acids and taking in less than the essential amino acids, less of them, will always not be a, a better strategy than taking all of them. It's just, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. And that's been borne out too in, in the literature. So yeah, uh, not that uh, leucine is a so leucine certainly is a driver, but leucine is replete in whey protein, is replete in leucine. So if you're taking in a, uh, let's say a scoop of whey, you're going to get sufficient leucine. Yeah, some people do it a lot, use the shotgun approach. So if I can take a lot of everything, then it'll be better. But we just mentioned that beyond a certain point, there's no benefit. You're just going to oxidize yeah. those amino acids. So uh, do you basically subscribe to the idea that uh, according to if you equate for calories and protein, uh, the ratio, for example, of uh, carbs versus fats is a little bit of... Uh, um, a personal choice? Your personal choice, and to some extent, depending upon whether you're looking to like compete, uh, it also can be individual. Genetics can dictate how a response. I'm not it's not really clear why even, but but yeah, at the uh, elite levels, uh, uh, there can be differences just based on your personal response. Some people seem to do better with somewhat higher carbs, some people with somewhat lower carbs. But absolutely, adherence is key to. Uh, to any nutritional regimen. I can give someone the perfect diet, but the perfect diet doesn't exist. And the perfect diet is specific to the individual. The diet that I might create that say, you know what, if you do this, you're going to get shredded. And they say, I can't eat like that. And what good is that diet? So the, the best diet is the diet that someone can stick with and that meets their needs within their, their own adherence requirements. That is a great way to almost finish because I just want to ask you one more thing, and, I, and I'm sure you're you've you've heard this question a thousand times. What's the best training split? 
I'm going to end after this. And <laughs> you already probably know my answer that there is no such thing as a best anything that would depend on the individual. So there's so many different ways to structure a routine and uh, it can be different for each individual. So to try to look for the best of anything is always... Uh, you're chasing rainbows. <laughs> we love chasing rainbows here in Portugal. <laughs> But, uh, however, uh, you said that most body, a hundred percent of the bodybuilders that you studied always all do a, Did a, a split routine, a, a, a some type of, yeah, split. some type of split yeah. routine. So split routines are, are basically endemic in, uh, in pro body and, and bodybuilders, I shouldn't say pros in, in all bodybuilders. And, and that there is somewhat of a reason for it because they're generally training with higher frequencies and they want at least a day's rest. If you're going to do a total body workout, and this is even some people have questioned, you could do total body workouts every day. And we've actually carried out research on that showing that there's no benefit to that. But anyway, the general rule is, is that you can, uh, you should be giving your muscles at least a 48 hours rest between their training. And that's why bodybuilders structure like chest day on Monday, because chest day is universal. Monday is universal chest day. And then back on Tuesday and legs on Wednesday, et cetera, where they're going to then allow good volume. Now, whether that's a good strategy or not, uh, the research probably shows not. They certainly get jacked doing it. So you can't argue with that part of the facts. Could they get better results uh, by maybe not having some wasted sets in terms of that type of structure? Perhaps. Um, this is a, this is an unfor. I, I I want to talk about something which is uh, a happiness to us and uh, an, an unhappiness, an unfortunate uh, thing. So, uh, new um, numbers just came out, and I thought it was seven percent. But unfortunately, in Portugal, active population enrolled in a gym is only five point four percent. It's very very low. Our neighbors in Spain, uh, it's twelve percent, so it's double. Mm. Uh, so are you saying that Portugal is a lazy country? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, the the main thing we find in it's Portugal, the food and is food is so good and the beaches are yeah. so nice. It's it's, it's a good place to be lazy. We have a very good quality of life, even though we're not. I'm not sure. This is going to sound bad, but we're not very patriotic. We're patriotic, but mm -hmm. not in the sense we're always complaining. You know, you always say, yeah, yeah, our country is so small. Oh, there's nothing in our country. Oh, we're always complaining. So. Um, how, uh, but, um, I think that we would uh, really like to have a boost. And, um, to my point, what was, uh, oh, uh, the Portuguese people I see, and I have this, I have this notion because I have a, a lot of Brazilian audience as well, for, for example, so I can do the comparison. So Brazilian people love to work out. They love to work out, so my best viewed videos are uh, stuff like a chest workout at home or the, the how do you have a huge back, stuff like that they love. But Portuguese people is what can I take? So in terms of nutrition or if there was a pill for you to take that would do everything for you, we would love it. So it's always what can I take, what can I take, I want to get big. It's like you can take some common sense you can take some good judgment you can go to the gym uh, you can take an ass whoop <laughs> whatever but uh um i'm i'm uh you we were talking earlier that you're you might have a sabbatical one of these uh, next uh, few years and you were actually thinking of um, who knows coming to portugal because you like it so much uh, so that's true could you help us uh, lift up that 5.4 Uh, Is it a tall I will, order? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I can do that. I certainly can carry out some cool research here. Uh, the facilities at the University of Lisbon are, are just incredible. Uh, Sandro uh, Freitas, who brought me over here to give the seminar here, uh, just has a great lab. And the uh, I've just been so impressed with the quality of research uh, that's being conducted here. So hopefully by uh, helping to promote the research that's being carried out here, that in itself maybe can can impact the uh, interest in, in fitness. We would certainly welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. No Dr. Brad, it was my pleasure. Me and too. follow Dr. Brad on Look Great Naked. What an excellent title. I don't know how I didn't get it first. LookGreatNaked.com is your website. We've been showing it while we look, were spoke. Look we were Great speaking. Naked. Look Great Naked. Yes. And, uh, and uh, the Instagram, uh, the Brad Schoenfeld PhD. Uh, correct. I, my Twitter is, I think Twitter is just at Brad Schoenfeld and I think Instagram is at Brad Schoenfeld PhD, but oh, yeah, it's, up there. it's up there. If you on the search screen. for me, Perfect. then, yeah. uh, 
then you got it. Of course. So so keep following because a lot of new stuff coming up. A lot of how many studies you have uh, waiting. Oh, waiting. I have a ton. So I've published now over 170, I believe, uh, pub publications. But I have, well, I have 30 or so. These are, but yeah, I collaborate with a lot of great groups. And I think we have over 30 that are in review right now. So, wow. Lot, lots more in store, and then others are in progress. So the idea is just to uh, really further the literature. We've been, uh, for so long, there was just not a lot of hypertrophy research, and now it's just, it's to me, beautiful to see that it's being a topic that's people want to know about and that we're getting a lot of good research on. So I think so. The more and more, the better. Thank you so yep. much once again. My pleasure.